UTS-50 is just around the corner and I have run it twice. The first time I made all the rookie mistakes and last year I ran a much more sensible race which also made it more enjoyable. So today we're going to go through all the things you need to know to have lots of fun, to get to the finish line and to make it just the best experience ever. We'll start by talking about the fun stuff like the course and the race strategy and then we'll go through some essential pieces of kit information and lastly we'll talk about logistics, of around the race village and in the race itself. So let's get into it. I think of the race like four mountains. I care more about the fact that it's four mountains than I do that it's a 50k. I think of it in eight segments, which are the four ups and the four downs. As you know, the race starts in the Slate Museum in Clamberis and UTMB are very good at hyping you up and getting the adrenaline buzzing. Last year, there was a traditional local band that felt like war music. And the trick here is to not go flying out thinking you're Tom Evans or Courtney DeWalter. Settle into a steady pace, enjoy your way out of the Clamberis village, soak up the mountains, the looming mountains in the distance, and then you get onto the Clamberis path. This is the start of a nearly 900 meter climb up to Finger Point, which is near the summit of Snowdon. Two years ago, we ran the route backwards and that created a big bottleneck at the beginning of the race, but they've now switched it. And this was a great move because there's no bottleneck and the Clamberis path is actually a fairly wide path that allows people to spread out a bit. Plus this year they're doing the staggered starts, the waves. So hopefully it's not too busy. It is busy at the start of a UTMB race, UTS, but I didn't find it too much of a problem personally. Once you hit the steep stuff, there's a general universal speed where everyone's just hiking up it. It might be a bit frustrating if you're faster, but hopefully the staggered start helps that. The Clamberis path is probably the easiest climb of the day, although it is a big one. If the weather is good, you are blessed with the most amazing views at the top and it just the vista opens up after the long climb. You then start on down the pig track. The pig track is probably the most rugged and technical descent of the day. So again, take it slow. The aim of the game on this descent is to to protect your ankles. If you're new to mountain running, what do we even mean by technical? Well, the ground is very uneven. It isn't a nicely laid out trail and you have to focus on every single foot placement. Last year, I made a mistake and trod on a loose rock, which then flipped and clattered me in the ankle bone and I nearly twisted my ankle. Plus it was really sore on the bone. So it really taught me to pay more attention. There are also some big steps down where you have to have your hands on rocks to help you. It's not exactly scrambling, but but it's definitely not a runnable descent for the average runner. Take it steady and protect your ankles. As you're going down the pig track, you'll see a road at the bottom and there is an aid station there. Don't make the mistake I made last year to think that that is your aid station. Which way? That is an aid station for the 100k and the 165. I'd driven past it the day before where it was an active aid station. I just assumed it was mine, but actually the 50k aid station is probably another 15 minutes past that point, which is called Penny Pass. You go down further into the valley, you turn to the right from the car park there, and the 50k aid station is in Guastadana's farm, another 15 minutes run or so. Mentally prepare yourself for that. I found it frustrating to think that I had an aid station coming up, but actually I didn't. So get ready for that. When you're at that first aid station, take your time, make sure you prepare yourself because the next segment is the longest segment between aid stations. You've got the second climb up Snowdon all the way to the summit and this climb, bearing in mind my overall run, took me about 10 hours. Just the climb took me just over two hours. It was just over three hours to the next aid station in total. Last year, the day was very hot and that was the hottest part of the day. So that huge climb made Made me run out of water. Stupidly, I was carrying two water bottles in my chest and a bladder in the back and I didn't fill up the bladder so I was only running with these. If it's hot, prepare yourself for that long climb with extra water. However, the route itself is epic. The second climb up Snowdon starts on the Watkin Path before splitting to take you the long way around up to the South Ridge to the summit of Snowdon. This is the sort of route that makes you feel very small and this is what mountain running is all about. It's at this point that I I remember feeling like, wow, this is a big race. I still have a long way to go. I had something amazing happen in this segment and that's that I had two consecutive miles have exactly the same time to the second and they were both 33 
2 minutes 20 seconds. I did 2 miles in 66 minutes 40 seconds. This really is a long slog up here, but once you've broken the back of it, you have this beautiful ridge to traverse along to get to the summit. I really hope the weather's good for you because it's the most beautiful landscape just to take in to see what you've just conquered. We're at the summit. <laughs> From the top, you then start a six kilometer descent down to the next aid station. This section has some incredibly runnable parts to it. And my advice is that unless you're an elite ultra runner with lots of mountain experience, slow down. Two years ago, I made the huge mistake of thinking I could make up time in the race on the downhills. And I really let myself go down these things pretty fast. Turns out, my quads did not like that and I completely crash and burned. This second descent is where you can really let loose with some speed, but my advice is don't. Be sensible here and that will pay dividends later in the race. Next up, we have Menid Moa, which is the shortest climb of the race, but do not be fooled. There is an incredibly steep section in the middle of it that had me taking steps that were just about six inches long. I'm gonna get more into this when I talk about strategy in a little while, but my rule for me personally when I was racing was that I was allowed to stop at aid stations, but I always wanted to keep making forward progress between aid stations. This third climb almost brought me to a standstill and actually there were many people at the side sitting to rest their legs but this is where you find out whether you've been sensible on the previous climbs. It was only after the race that I was thinking that two years ago there was a section that I kept slipping down and I couldn't even stand up. I just decided to use the mountain as a slide. No injuries. I remembered a really grassy section that because it had been raining I couldn't stand up and I literally had to slide on my bum the whole way down and then I remembered the race had been done backwards and it was this section the one that this year will be the third climb it was so steep so I'm now really glad we're going up that because it's mostly grass and if that's wet you just slide all the way down let's hope for the views again before heading down to the final aid station you'll be building confidence now the end kind of feeling in sight then and there's one more climb to go, Mol Elio. Well, I say there's one more climb. The most mean part of this entire race is this little lump that you see here. When you get to the summit of Mol Elio, on a clear day, you can see Clamveris where the finish line is. You feel like it's all downhill. Then you start the descent and then there's this little blip on the map, which is actually a really steep section. I was back to my little six inch steps again, pulling hard on my poles. But once you've done that bit, then you really are into the final run back into Clamveris to the finish. You pick up back on the Clamveris path where you started. So you might start to recognize some things. And if you have any energy left in your legs, you can start to let yourself go. This is where I started to reflect last year on the day I just had. And my God, it was such a good day. I got a bit emotional the effort, the terrain, the beauty, it was so, so good. My strategy had been so much better last year and I could just enjoy flying down this final descent and coast into the finish. Two years ago, I'd literally been sidestepping down because my quads had blown up. So it was a joy to be in good shape at the end and enjoy that final bit of running. When you get back into the Slate Museum, you're greeted with noise and people and you feel like a hero for battling the Snowdonian Mountains and it's the best feeling in the world. So let's get into some of the strategic points. I covered some of them when talking about the course, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about pacing, nutrition, and the weather. For pacing, all I'm going to say is take it so much slower than you think. Everyone is going to be jacked up on adrenaline at the beginning. Even with the staggered starts, it's still going to be busy. You're going to want to stay with a pack or you're going to want to break free from a pack. All I will say is none of that matters. You're not going to make your race in those first two climbs, but you could certainly break your race. Two years ago, I made all these mistakes too. I went out way too fast, but I crashed and burned for the final two climbs. I had so many people overtake me while I was just hobbling down these descents. And then last year, I took things so much slower. My heart rate was much more balanced throughout the first couple of climbs. And then it was my turn to start overtaking people on the third and fourth climbs, which was a great feeling. I wasn't taking pleasure in 
and there suffering, but I just felt so good that this time I could keep moving when I knew that the year before I was the one in so much pain. As for nutrition, I have a whole video about long run nutrition, which I'll link in the description, but I advise to eat regularly. The mountains take so much more out of your legs, so you'll be using up more energy than you're used to. I personally try to get through a certain amount of carbs and calories every hour. I also use precision hydration salt capsules, and I would take two capsules in every valley to help prepare my body with salts before going up the climb which is when I would sweat a bit more. Most of the time it was okay just to have a litre of fluid on me in the 500ml bottles on my chest but I would also have some tailwind in them and I used to take the sticks of tailwind to top up 200 calories at the aid stations in each bottle. I also carried the bladder with me in the back and if it's hot you'll definitely want to top that up and you may want to consider topping it up at the first aid station to get you to the next aid station which is the longest gap between eight. And now on to the weather. All you can say is that it's the mountains the weather can change at any minute and if it does prepare yourself quickly. Two years ago we had a sudden change of wind which made me freezing and at the time I was in a rhythm. I was climbing up Snowdon for the first time and I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to break that rhythm. By the time I got to the top I was so cold and I could feel my body wasting all this energy trying to warm back up again and it was utterly miserable. It was so stupid because it would have taken me a maximum of two minutes to put a windbreaker on, put some gloves on, put a hat on, but I just felt like I needed to keep going for some reason. It would have been so much better if I stopped straight away and prepared for the change in weather. So if the weather changes for you, stop, prepare yourself for it, then you can keep moving forwards. It's just not worth letting the weather disrupt your race. Last year we had very hot weather and people weren't quite prepared for that either. Not their fault, but we'd had a very gray and cold spring and then that sun was the first sun anyone had experienced. If that happens again, get yourself a goofy sun hat, protect your skin with maximum sun tan lotion. It's just not worth the weather disrupting your race and it's always better to be over prepared in the mountains than under prepared. And now on to kit. We'll start off by talking about every ultra runner's favorite topic, shoes. The way I think about shoes in Snowdonia is it's very tricky because there are so many different types of terrain. There's the uneven technical rocky trails, there's slippy rock, there's nice gravel, there's bog and mud and marsh and grass. So the way I think about shoes is you either need a good all-rounder that can just cope with all of it, it's not a master of any of them but it can kind of cope with all of those different terrains, or you pick a shoe that will help you in the thing that you know is your weakness. So if I give you an example, and this is actually more relevant to the route two years ago when I was talking about that steep grassy downhill section, which is now a steep grassy uphill section. If it was raining and I knew I had to go down that steep grassy section again, I fell over so many times and that brings a risk of injury. I would probably wear a shoe with quite a big tread and I would favor a shoe that helps me in that bit that brings the highest risk of injury. Because we're now running it the other way around and there weren't any bits of the race that really felt dangerous to me. I didn't feel like I'd fall over anywhere. I would personally now choose a good all-rounder, which for me is the Ultra Olympus. I'm actually debating whether I'm going to buy a new pair of Ultra Olympus shoes this year or if I'm going to get the Mont Blanc, but either way they're both just good all-rounders that can cope kind of okay with everything even though they're not a master in any of those particular situations. Whatever shoe you pick, I do think it helps to have a big high stack. In my training I have the Ultra Olympus but I also have the Ultra Lone Peak. Personally I'd find the Lone Peak probably a bit too thin for some of the technical jazz Jaggedy rocks, but that's just me. You can decide what you want there, but for me, higher stack helps. The other thing I see people debating in the Facebook group is should you use poles or not? My simple answer is yes. What the poles do is they allow you to use your big, powerful upper body muscles on the way up. It's your lats and your triceps helping to drag you up the hills. On the way down, they can help you balance by using your pecs and your core muscles a bit better by helping you to decelerate, which helps deload your quads. And in worst case scenario, if you did pick up an injury, the poles might be the thing that get you to the next aid station or even to the finish line while injured. I won't go through all the rest of the kit, but let me know down in the comments if you do want me to break down all of the mandatory kit and some of my personal favorites and my personal choices. All I will say is that absolutely make sure you have practiced with your kit. It should be an obvious statement, but try packing your bag in different ways and when you're out running, take things out like your gloves and your waterproof and your nutrition just to see how 
easy it is and eventually you'll reconfigure it into a way that works well for you. And lastly, let's get into logistics. The day before the race is registration and for the 50k it's between 2pm and 10pm. You'll need to bring your ID and your entire running pack. They do check mandatory kit and you do need your ID so don't forget it. Last year 50k runners didn't get a GPS tracker on their shoulder and I think that's going to be the same this year. Instead, you had to run with an app on your phone called Live Run and people would follow you there. It wasn't great, to be honest, and my family told me that there were long gaps between the app updating. I'm guessing that's because of phone signal, but it's better than nothing. Last year, there were some professional runners speaking at around 6 p.m. in the tent where the registration was done, and this actually stopped registration, which created a massive queue. This would have really annoyed me if I got stuck in that because it would have made my dinner time and my bedtime later. But at the time of making this video, there is nothing written about this in the event schedule, so hopefully they're not doing that this year, which will make the afternoon and evening registration easier for you. The Ultra Village was much better last year than the year before, and I'm assuming it'll be even better again this year. There was a good selection of kit stalls and food and coffee and nutrition. There was generally a great atmosphere when hanging around on the Friday and then before and after the race on the Saturday. On the day of the race, make sure you're really clear about your parking. I haven't actually parked because I always stay in Clamberis and I can walk to the start line so I can't speak about this personally. A friend of mine had to use the 50k parking last year and he said it was about 30 to 40 minute walk to the start line so make sure you figure out the route and how long it's going to take you. Also, if you're staying in villages local to Clamberis and you're expecting to get the bus, check the times because some of the popular places that people stay, the buses only start at 7am, which is definitely too late. However you're getting to the start, make sure you get there early because as with all races there are long queues for your last nervous poo and you want to get there and soak up the atmosphere because this race is epic. I bet you're going to have the absolute best time and I really do hope you make it to that finish line with a huge smile on your face. If you're new here to my channel in my day job I'm an osteopath and I created this channel to help prepare your body for epic adventures like this one so I'm going to leave you with a playlist here to have a look around and see if anything else could help you prepare for this race and until next time, happy training.